Hello, my name is Martin Hinchelwood and I run Naked Agility with Martin Hinchelwood. I'm a professional Scrum trainer, Microsoft MVP, um, and I've been working with the Azure DevOps team at Microsoft for nearly 15 years. And I'm here to tell you their story. I'd like to thank uh, StackConf uh, for this opportunity to talk to you. Um, please feel free to ask any questions in the chat. I'll, I'll be there. Um, or at any time on Twitter, um, at Mr. Hinch is, is me. Uh, you can even find many other webcasts of mine uh, on nakedagility.tv. And I'll be providing a link uh, to the presentation at the end uh, that will include much more information uh, about the Azure DevOps team evolution towards agility. I'm not going to be able to cover uh, everything that I would love to cover in uh, 45 minutes. So, uh, first thing to think about is uh, what what is uh, DevOps? Uh, that's an interesting uh, uh, thing because to dev to to people DevOps means different things. Everybody thinks of it differently. Some people think of it as it's their job title. I'm a DevOps engineer or I'm a DevOps support technician. Whatever those things are. It could be about automation. It could be uh, about just being faster or bringing development and operations together. And it's kind of about all of these things. So I just want to show a little video uh, that will maybe help us illustrate uh, or help me illustrate the, the scope and breadth uh, that is uh, DevOps. So if you just uh, watch uh, for a minute, uh, the first uh, video, I'm going to show uh, two videos. The second one's much shorter. Uh, two videos. The first one uh, is from Formula uh, uh, Formula One uh, quite a long time ago. Uh, and the second one is from Formula One more recently. But Holland comes in for a pit stop. Time to refuel and change tires. Moore himself changes the tires. Only four crew members, including the driver, are allowed to work on the car. It's a tense time. Holland stays in his seat, anxious to get away. Let's watch. are changed at last. A crewman polishes the windshield as Holland moves away just 67 seconds after he stopped. 67 seconds. So what did you what did you notice uh, was the difference between those two? You might have noticed that there was a lot more people involved uh, in a modern Grand Prix uh, than there was before. Um, and I would kind of argue that there's a lot more people involved in delivering software today than there ever was in the past. Um, it's it's a much bigger industry. And if you think about uh, 20 years ago, um, when uh, uh, Scrum was, Scrum's a little bit older than 20 years, uh, the Agile Manifesto is a little bit uh, younger than 20 years, but 20 years ago, it was much harder to deliver software than it is now. Today, uh, we have a lot more people involved. There's a lot more things going on. And while it's easier to deliver software, there's a lot more moving parts and I think this this video kind of illustrates that that increase in the number of people. Also, I I would point out that it it this particular scenario was not really about 
the, the people that are involved, they're all doing uh, uh, specialized jobs. Um, there's one person for each thing. So it's more like automation. All of these people are providing a piece of automation uh, for this puzzle. They're like little microservices all working together. There's one service to remove the tire, another to replace it. Uh, one service to just uh, jack up the vehicle. And I don't know if you um, can see there, but behind the person with the jack is another person with a jack, a backup jack. It must have failed at some point uh, uh, during these uh, 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 pit stops and they have uh, somebody there to back that person up. Uh, that's the fix they've put in just just to make sure uh, that it happens correctly. Um, and there are people all over the place monitoring the, the process, uh, making seeing how, how fast things are, how efficient things are, and maybe potentially changing things up for the next pick stop to make it just that little bit faster. So there's kind of constant change going on there as well to that automation. Kind of like your DevOps pipeline. There's also this idea, um, we, we, we talk about it a lot in software now called shift left. We want to push more things to the source of the problem uh, than to the uh, 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 outcomes later. So for example, we want to find more bugs during the development process rather than during uh, the production process. But in order to do that, we, we need to shorten all of our feedback loops. And if you see the, the, first, the first pit stop took over 60 seconds. Um, and if you watch the video, you'll see the majority of the time uh, was in changing changing the tires. Uh, the the refueling was done uh, many 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 seconds before uh, uh, the tires were were changed. So the the most difficult time consuming problem uh, that they had in that uh, 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 time was changing the tires. You saw him get, trying to get the sledgehammer in to, to hammer off uh, the tires. So that that change that uh, it was much longer. Refueling's done. You can see he's not even got the first tire off when the refueling is completed. Uh, so the biggest pain is uh, the tire change. Now the more astute of you might have noticed uh, that during the Melbourne uh, pit stop, they didn't even refuel the car. Once they became faster at changing the tires, the thing that took uh, much longer was the, the refueling. Um, and in fact, if you look at the history of Formula One, uh, you'll see there was a point in time uh, uh, where they tried to fix the refueling problem by refueling the cars faster. Uh, and that resulted in some uh, uh, big accidents and casualties uh, because they were putting the fuel in too fast. Uh, things heat up when you do things fast and there were explosions and fires in the, in, in the pits. Uh, so what they changed to was a tactic of making the cars more efficient so you didn't need to refuel them as often. So making the engines more efficient uh, uh, improved that. And I think that's that's the the takeaway uh, from those two videos. It's not uh, uh, about uh, just you know we're going to go and install DevOps. It's about a continuous process of evolution. We are changing uh, from uh, uh, long processes to making things as short as possible, and then figuring out how do we make all those short things. Uh, more efficient. That's your DevOps pipeline. So if I was to define DevOps, um, I love this uh, quotes from Donovan Brown at Microsoft. He's their uh, DevOps practice lead. Um, and DevOps is the union of people, processes, and products to enable the continuous delivery of value to your end users. If you look at the definition for any of the Agile uh, practices, Scrum or Kanban, uh, you'll see it. They are both about uh, um, adapting the process to deliver value as quickly as possible. Um, and that's the important thing there. Uh, according to uh, the 2018 State of DevOps uh, report, uh, presented by Dora, uh, the top performing DevOps companies, uh, when compared to the low performing ones, spend 66% less time 
on customer support issues, 50% less time on customer identified defects. Um, and more importantly, they spend over 66% more time on new work. What would your business rather spend money and time on? Would they rather spend money on customer support issues, defects and security issues, or would they rather spend uh, their money on new features? I know what my business would prefer to spend its money on. Uh, these high performing organizations spend more time innovating um, and less time keeping the lights on. That's what we're trying to achieve. How do we reduce uh, that that piece? Um, and we can be more adaptive to the market the shorter uh, that piece is. And I'm just trying to think of two epic uh, failures that I could uh, uh, list for you. And I did actually think of, think of uh, two. Uh, one was a quality issue, um, very poor quality deliverable that resulted in massive expense in trying to get this product uh, out the door. And it was a product called Windows Vista. That was a multi-billion dollar uh, mistake, uh, mistake error problem for Microsoft at the time. Um, at one point, uh, I, I heard tell uh, that Microsoft took 70,000 software engineers off of all the other stuff they were working on to go fix bugs in Windows Vista to get it out the door. And it didn't have, I, I, I don't know if, if, you, if you've been following Windows Vista, you might've seen um, all of the, here's the awesome features we're gonna ship in this product at the start of the release. And almost none of them made it into the final release. They had to cut uh, most of the new features in order to pay back their technical debt, fix their struggle with complexity. So that was a, 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 a quality issue in that version of the, the product. Um, they then fixed that with Windows 7, whatever you may think about Windows in general, Windows 7 is a pretty stable, well-regarded product. And then they made another mistake. Uh, they had a mismatch to customer desires. Windows 8, you either loved it or you hated it. It drove a lot of people away from Windows um, because they changed too much too quickly. Uh, so they had to roll a lot of it back with Windows 8.1, um, if you remember that. And then Windows 10 is a completely uh, different model. And I'm gonna mention them, Windows 10, uh, a few times. Uh, but what I really want to talk about, where I want to focus our time, is on the team at Microsoft that drove the need for agility, the need for DevOps inside of Microsoft. The need for that change from a, a Tayloristic, uh, long traditional project management delivery schedule to uh, an empirical based uh, continuous delivery model. Um, this team, uh, the Azure DevOps team at Microsoft was the first big team inside of Microsoft to do this, uh, to move towards that model, uh, to just deal with their problems um, and getting faster at delivering stuff, creating transparency, which means you can see your problems and then just deal them with them one at a time. Um, but many other teams inside of Microsoft have followed so much so that the majority of teams today inside of Microsoft are now agile, continuous delivery teams. Even Windows is delivered on a continuous delivery schedule to over uh, 900 million machines worldwide. So nearly a billion machines in the world uh, receive Windows on a continuous uh, flow basis, which is, uh, 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 if the Windows team can do it uh, with four and a half thousand software engineers working on it and the complexity of the product that they have, the rest of us really don't have an excuse anymore. But the Azure DevOps team uh, kind of started it. They had a little product called Team Foundation Server. And uh, this little uh, product, uh, they wanted to, to deliver faster. They found uh, that they had massive uh, uh, issues. So they moved in 2010 uh, with Sprint 1 in August of 2010 to delivering uh, their product and software a lot more uh, quickly, they moved to three week sprints. That's what worked for them. Sprint one uh, started in 2010, where they moved their product to the cloud. Uh, they created uh, what is now Azure DevOps as an online service, um, and then continued to ship to production every three weeks for the next eight years. 
Uh, in November 2018, they were on Sprint 145. I think they just shipped Sprint 170. I think it's 170 uh, to production. Um, and they have not missed a Sprint deadline for reasons other than business value in nearly 10 years. Uh, so what I mean by that is that uh, at the end of every sprint, they have been technically able to ship to production and the vast majority of the time they have shipped to production. Uh, there's been a couple of sprints that fell over uh, some kind of holiday, usually Christmas, where there's not many people there and the business just deemed that there wasn't enough value to warrant shipping to production. And I think that's uh, the decision that your business should have. It should not be a technical decision. It should You should have usable working software at the end of every sprint. Um, and that's what they tried to achieve. But they found uh, that the focus need to ch change in their organization. Uh, Satya is now the CEO of Microsoft. Uh, and he talks about this one engineering system at Microsoft. Um, and they moved really aggressively towards Azure DevOps as the one ES, one engineering system. Uh, they're now following on from that. This is a point in time story, okay? Uh, don't just copy Microsoft's model, make your own model. Uh, they are now flowing into one ES is currently a hybrid between uh, GitHub and Azure DevOps, depending on the team. Uh, and they're moving more towards GitHub as that one engineering system, but it's gonna take time to get there because Azure DevOps is a lot more featureful uh, than GitHub is just now. But I think the important takeaway here is uh, the, the middle uh, section there. So I would, any day of the week, trade off features for our own productivity. It's much more valuable for you as engineers, for your organization to have your engineers working on productivity uh, solutions. How do we make our engineering process faster? How do we get better at delivering software? That's where your focus should be. And that mental mentality, that mental shift has transitioned Microsoft from uh, an organization that shipped to production maybe once every two years. Uh, the TFS team, the Azure DevOps team was once every two years. Uh, Windows was between four and six years, depending on the, the release. I mean, these were long development schedules. Um, now, uh, DevOps, if you look at just the data that comes out of Azure DevOps, so Microsoft One ES solution that we can all use as well, but that's, that's that solution. Uh, they have 96,000 engineers working in Azure DevOps and they're doing 183,000 deployments per day. That's more deployments than they have engineers, many more. 2 million Git per, commits per month, 500,000 work items updated per month, 5 million work item views per day. I mean, these are really powerful figures. That's a massive difference uh, for their organization. Uh, there's a, a bunch of information on the link at the bottom, but I want to talk to you about the things that Microsoft did to improve that. I'm going to try and get through as many of these as possible. Again, the slides will be available for you at the end of the session. Um, and I'm quite happy to chat about any of them during the session. I'll be there to talk to you. So ask any questions in the chat, which I think will be on, oh, I think it will be here. Uh, the chat should be below me uh, and I'll be there to answer those questions. So there are a number of things that changed inside of Microsoft, a lot of things changed in order to get uh, to, to, to this, uh, this new model, things that are just true, okay? Things that we have to, you'll figure out your way of solving the problem, but these are things you're going to have to deal with. So the first one is being customer obsessed. You have to focus on the customer. You don't just want customers to be okay with your product or happy with your product. They need to be delighted with your product. And the way you do that is you need to listen to your customers, but you need to use quantitative measures to listen to your customers. Don't just think you know what they want. Uh, Microsoft uses many tools for this. They have their developer community and forums. Again, Azure DevOps is a developer focused tool. Uh, so they have a little bit of a leg up there. Uh, they have a uh, user voice, they have Stack Overflow, um, they have in-product 
uh, feedback and suggestions. You can report a problem, uh, make a suggestion, and all of those things that you type in there uh, will get to the software engineering teams working on that part of the product. That is the point. The software engineering teams need to be brought closer to your customer. How do you do that at scale? These are some of the methods uh, you're going to use to do that at scale. Uh, so providing that feedback, uh, getting it actionable. In fact, um, this is a, a list of all of the customers, the biggest customers uh, that use Azure DevOps. Uh, so one of my customers is one, two, three, fourth from the top. Um, uh, there's a couple of other of my customers in there or companies that I've worked with, but fourth from the top is one of my customers. And you can see they're looking at the customer satisfaction with each area of the product. Um, so this is uh, based on number of engaged users. So there's my customer, fourth from the top, has 4,914 engaged users when this spreadsheet was created. Um, and their satisfaction with each of uh, the areas of the product. And you can see that there's one that's uh, very low and there's actually a good reason for that, uh, which is a company specific thing. But um, you can see they're looking at that data. They're understanding their customer a lot better than they've ever had to before and specific customers as well. Uh, so they have a definition of done for this team. Uh, their definition of done is live in production. That, that as far as I'm concerned, as a, as a professional Scrum trainer, um, I believe that in order for software to be usable and in order for you to get feedback from your users, you, you have to be in production. Um, it's really not okay uh, to just be on your test server and you're going to do UAT. That does not get you actionable feedback from real users. You need to be in production. And if you're going to be in production, you need to be collecting as much telemetry as possible uh, to support whatever hypothesis you had for adding that feature or making that change in the first place. So you don't just make changes, you have to have a hypothesis. If I make this change, this will happen. We're gonna measure these things and we should see this result and then measure it, monitor it, and make sure you're getting towards those things. And so in order to do that, you need to collect lots of data. Um, and the Azure DevOps team collect um, a, a plethora of uh, data on how their uh, product is doing, how we as users are interacting with their product, what features we're using, how often we're using those features, whether we're able to find those features, all kinds of things uh, in there. So if we look at some of their uh, measures, they're measuring usage, uh, so acquisition, engagement, satisfaction, churn, um, and feature usage. These are all uh, important uh, measures from a, a front-end perspective. They're measuring uh, velocity, how fast they're able to go. So with time to build, time to self-test, how long does it take for a software engineer to get to the point where they can test their own code, which might be different from time to build because you have to set up a bunch of stuff. Uh, time to deploy uh, and time to learn. How quickly can we learn from our uh, mistakes, learn from our uh, features? These are important uh, measures as well. And live site health. Um, you need to have your software engineers supporting the product in order to really understand uh, that your product is working, that it's online, that everything is good. So time to detect, time to communicate, time to mitigate an issue, customer impact for an issue. These are all things uh, that you're going to be monitoring and measuring. I'm going to add some things, which you might want to screenshot, that you should not be measuring. Uh, don't measure original estimate, completed hours, lines of code, team capacity, team burndown, team velocity, or number of bugs found. They are all irrelevant uh, to your ability to deliver value to your customers. And in fact, watching and monitoring these things uh, will have a negative impact on your ability to deliver value to your customers. Uh, so watch out you uh, for that for sure. Uh, in order to... Um, I, I always like to say, how, how do we um, learn to do something well? The only way to do that is to do it all of the time. Uh, we have to build a, a habit. Uh, if something is painful and hard to do, we need to do it more to get better at it, to build that muscle memory. So you need to find what hurts 
and do it more, uh, get around that loop and iterate much more quickly than you ever have in the past. Um, in the old way for this particular team, uh, they had a, a you know the traditional, uh, we've got some coding, we've got a test and stabilization phase, uh, we're going to have a beta release, and then we'll do some more code, we'll have a code freeze, test and stabilization in the RTM. But what they found was it was impossible um, to respond to the customer feedback. By the time you're in your, you're past your beta phase, okay, your first beta phase, and you're getting feedback from your customers, product management has already started planning the next release. So even getting feedback between beta and RTM, you can't add new features. You're probably not going to be able to add those new features to the next version of your product. It's going to get into the one after that. So you've got a four, this particular team had a two year release cycle with a service pack halfway. So they were talking four years to really action feedback from users on the grander scheme of the, the product, um, which is just far too long in the modern uh, software world. So in the new way, uh, they started delivering uh, uh, sprints. So sprint one, two, three, four, three big sprints, let's just go. But they, when they first started, um, they had a, a, a little, we need a little bit of a safety net. We feel like this is going to be hard. We feel like we need an extra uh, safety net in there. So they created this stabilization period of time after sprint five, and then they would start sprint six. And what they wanted to happen was that as they were going, uh, their engineers would fix uh, uh, bugs. So issues would appear, they would fix them, appear, fix them as this kind of uh, line wibbles along of A being uh, the number of defects uh, in the product. And then they shouldn't have anything to do in the stabilization phase, but we've got it there just in case. It's our safety net. But what they found was that actually having that safety net uh, caused the software engineers to think, you know, that mental, well, we, we can fix that in stabilization. We don't need to get that done just now. We've got that stabilization time. So they relied too heavily on it. Um, so try and avoid having uh, that at all. Uh, and then they moved to this uh, complete three week uh, sprint cycle. They actually have a four week cycle because it takes a week for them to deploy their software at the point in time uh, this uh, uh, happened. Um, so they, they have three weeks of their sprint is three weeks, uh, but deployment takes a week. Sprint three weeks, deployment takes a week. That's how that works. So they start the next sprint while the deployment for the previous sprint is still ongoing. Okay, that's why there's that overlap there you can see in the diagram. And what's happened for this team? What's the value that they've got from it? Uh, well, in 2012, they were delivering about 22 features uh, to production each year. That's 22 new features, new things for customers. Uh, now they're delivering over 250 new features to production each year. Imagine if your, um, if your uh, stakeholders could get 10 times the number of features per year, would they be willing to invest in uh, making things a little bit more efficient uh, making things better. That's that's really uh, what it's what it's all about. One of the other big changes they made was getting everybody onto a single uh, branching structure. So they use something that's kind of similar um, to to GitHub Flow, uh, not Git Flow. Git Flow is actually over complicated for 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 most organizations, but GitHub Flow, uh, where you have topic branches. Um, and the topic branches uh, uh, come off in a, in a uh, that's your, either your topic is either a hotfix, a bug, new feature, whatever, and they're very short lived. Um, but because they have that week that it takes to get into production and they may need to fix something in production, if that makes sense. Uh, they also, they, they created a new model called release flow um, where they have the, the M129 there in the releases uh, branch is from the sprint 129. So during sprint 130, M129 branch exists. At the end of uh, sprint 130, M129 ends and a new M130 
is created and that's what's deployed and managed in production. Uh, so they have master and then a kind of rolling uh, production uh, branch where they uh, never actually fix anything uh, in the release branch. Uh, they only ever fix it in dev and then uh, cherry pick those, sorry, in dev, in a topic branch, bring it into master and then they cherry pick those changes into the release branch. Uh, one of the reasons they do that is they found that if you do it in release, sometimes you forget to bring the changes back into master and then they reoccur later. Um, if you do it in master, there's zero chance of that error ever reoccurring in production. Worst case, at the end of this sprint, that's what's going to get released and everything will be fixed. Uh, so that's that's important. But because we're on this model, this continuous delivery model, we have to be able to release our software all the time. We have to be able to pull topic branches in. Uh, so we need feature flags. We need the ability without branches, without long running branches, um, to have the ability to hide parts of our code that are not quite ready for prime time yet. Uh, maybe that's for performance issues or uh, uh, to reduce uh, uh, the in, uh, uh, to to improve that. So that will allow you to reduce your integration debt. You're not having these divergent branches. Everything uh, works together. All the tests are run together, even for features that you haven't shipped yet. Okay. Um, so that allows you to do that as well as uh, make a new version of something at the same time as the existing piece of functionality running and then have a switch that lets you flip between it. Uh, and then you can do progressive exposure to customers. You can do all kinds of really clever things uh, uh, with that. Uh, dark launching, that's the expression that they use. Uh, but with this ability to just ship things to production uh, so quickly, uh, they found that it was a bad idea uh, to go live during an event. Um, these are uh, real outages uh, from events uh, that happened over over the years. Um, and uh, on stage, the system doesn't work. Uh, so they now have a policy where you can't go live with a feature. You can't announce it at a conference unless it's been in production for at least uh, 48 hours before uh, the conference itself. Uh, so that's why sometimes you'll see some things go live after a conference uh, and they'll announce it later. Cool, so let's iterate over the pain. We have about 14 minutes left, eh, maybe 13 minutes. Um, and I want to talk about a few more things. The first is a production first mindset. You have to think from the mindset of live site. Um, I have another, if you go to nakedagility.tv, um, I have a presentation on site reliability engineering for this team. Uh, so you can go uh, look up that, but it's really about uh, uh, we as software engineers need to be able to support production. We need to deal with that pain in production and we need to be transparent with our customers. We need to be able to say to our customers, here's what happened. Here's why it happened. We want to build trust with our customers. That's how we turn our customers into raving fans. Uh, they, they believe that we will do our best to solve the problem. They believe that we're uh, um, being honest with them um, and it allows uh, uh, that, that tighter uh, integration with our customers. Um, and we can't have no downtime. There's always going to be something that happens in production. Uh, so being as transparent with your customers uh, is, is important. Uh, the other thing uh, to mention is that uh, there's no there's no such thing as partial automation. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, anything in your software delivery process that is not automated is technical debt. Um, that's part of your 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 tech debt. You haven't done it yet. It's it's not automated. Partial automation. Uh, for example, uh, they did have at one point deployment scripts in OneNote uh, and an email um, and. This is a little bit of PowerShell. Can you tell what will happen in production when you run this PowerShell? Because it will error out. Do you know why it will error out? Could you even figure out how to uh, debug that? Some of you might be astute and have noticed that it's using the curly quotes, which will not work in code. Uh, and you could have hundreds of things like that, that it's been turned into curly quotes and having to go fix that, edit the script, 
just before you run into production is possibly the worst idea you could ever have. Uh, you want to have something that's been run so many times it's bulletproof and editing live before you go live is not the best way to do that. Um, people make mistakes, okay? Uh, so have everything automated. You, what you don't want to have any manual steps between a developer committing a line of code and it getting into production. This should be a completely automated process. I, I'm okay with having somebody needs to click an approve button. Okay, that's maybe we have to do that because of our business practices, uh, but it should be a business check, not a um, engineering check. We should be automated. There is no reason why you can't automate everything except poor quality code. It's difficult to automate poor quality code. And one of the ways you know it's not such great quality is that it's difficult to automate. Fix your code. Uh, when you do do deployments, you need to be able to, uh, I, I like this, control the blast radius. Who's going to be affected when you do a deployment when something goes wrong? Um, and something that the Azure DevOps team use and many other teams, including the Windows team use, is this uh, kind of idea of ring-based deployments or uh, the more general term is controlled exposure to production. Um, so you are deployed to production. Uh, you have your software in production, but who can access that new feature or who sees that new capability is dependent upon uh, uh, the, the, the feature flag. So you can turn it on for half your users. You can turn it on for a few of your users, only people that have opted in, uh, all kinds of things. You can do uh, things like that. And one of the things that they do do even for uh, just rolling things out uh, is they deploy to uh, ring one is maybe internal. Ring two might be uh the 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 smallest external data center and then they go with their largest external data center and then international data centers and then all the rest and you'll find that the windows team uh that you also use as your devops is way off in ring six um because they will scream the loudest if they're having a problem so it's really important to do um, and having that live site culture inside of your organization uh, you'll be able to see the other presentation that I talked about to dive uh, it's a full hour just on this topic um, but weekly reviews actionable alerts making sure you uh, do root cause analysis and add stuff to your backlog to make those problems uh, go away uh, so then I've got a little bit on um, teen auto autonomy versus enterprise alignment. There is a keen balance you have to create between reliability and innovation. You want to get faster at delivering stuff, but the age-old uh, uh, conflict between operations uh, and engineering is that engineers are measured based on the number of features they get into production and operations is measured by uptime and those things are antagonistic. If you make the same group of people responsible for both those measures then they'll work together effectively uh, to, to maximize both of them and think about if, if you're the if you're a software engineer and you get woken up at three o'clock in the morning because production's down, you're gonna think a lot more about the code that you write. Um, you can find a lot of really good information uh, on why we need a level of autonomy uh, for our engineers in Dan Pink's book, Drive. Uh, there's a really good uh, 10 minute YouTube video uh, on that, uh, I would definitely worth a watch. Uh, but the things that your teams need to become self-organizing, to become uh, an autonomous unit that's able to deliver high value products is autonomy, mastery, and purpose. Autonomy is being able to feel like you're in control of your own destiny. Mastery is that you wanna feel like you're doing a good job, that you're being effective. And purpose is that we feel that the things that we do are of value to others. Uh, those are really important. Uh, but as part of that, we've got, you know, the plan, we've got practices, we've got the organization, we've got roles, teams, cadence, we've got lots of things inside of that. And we need a certain level of autonomy. So the plan and practices for, this is where Microsoft, where this team at Microsoft had found their line, is the plan and practices, 100% up to the team. That's their autonomy but they have alignment of the organization roles, teams, cadence. Uh, so the sprint cadence, everybody's on the same sprint number at the same time. 
uh, and taxonomy, what we call things. Those are, uh, we have alignment of those things across the organization. Uh, so the team structure is they used to have program management, uh, development and testing as different parts of the organization. Uh, then they brought uh, testing in, so became a, a unified engineering team. And now in fact, uh, they create feature teams that have product engineering and operations is all part of that one team and they're accountable uh, for uh, designing the feature, building the feature, deploying the feature, monitoring the feature in production and fixing any bugs and getting woken up at three o'clock in the morning when customers have a problem. So that's really important. And part of that, that feature team idea is having uh, uh, teams. Now you might have physical team rooms. Obviously we're in a, a COVID uh, situation at the moment. So we're having a lot more virtual team rooms. I've been teaching all of my professional scrum classes virtually um, and it's totally doable. The problem that we had 20 years ago uh, when people talked more about co-location was the technology wasn't viable uh, for having these distributed teams. People work together effectively when we have high bandwidth communication. 80% of all communication is non-verbal. So the written word or just the spoken word, you need to be able to see the people you're interacting with and video calls, video conferencing are powerful enough now to, to resolve that problem. So you don't need physical team rooms anymore, but we need team rooms still. Uh, so cross-discipline, uh, these particular groups have found that between 10 and 12 people for what they're building uh, works best, uh, but other people will have different size teams depending on what works best uh, for them as well. Uh, they also have something called self-forming uh, teams uh, that they use. Uh, teams decide themselves what, what team they go on. Uh, there's a bigger explanation in the slides of how they might do that. I can talk about that. Um, I'm going to be doing a session in a little while on one of my favorite practices, which is the self-forming teams. Uh, so that will be coming up uh, soon. Uh, so that's three things. Let's see, I think I can do two things. Uh, two more things that we're going to cover. First is shift left. We want to move as many things uh, to that left hand side as possible uh, of getting closer to engineering, closer to the code uh, to find the problem. Uh, the Azure DevOps team used to have 99% of all their tests were manual tests or long running UI integration tests. And something that they've done over the last eight years is pay back that technical debt um, and move, get rid of as many L3, which is what they call them, L3 tests as possible and have more L0 tests. L0 means that the developers can run them in Visual Studio as part of their uh, integration work. And that has taken a long time. Uh, the orange was the bad tests and the blue is the good tests. And you can see that over time, uh, it, it took them nearly uh, four years. Uh, I would need to have a look at that a little bit closer, uh, but M78 all the way through to M120, I don't know how many sprints that is, that's 70, 70-ish sprints, 70-ish three-week sprints uh, to pay back that technical debt, doing it a little piece at the time. They're still delivering features at the same time, uh, but paying that back as they go, uh, really important. Uh, and Again, you can look at the data a little bit more closely. Uh, they moved to a more pull request uh, model. Uh, that is really important, being able to check all your code, have as many automated builds as possible. I have a minute and a half uh, left. Uh, so I've got just enough time to talk about uh, infrastructure. Uh, you need to be cloud first. There is no way you can be an agile team and deliver usable software in two week increments without being uh, cloud first. It's just impossible. British government have a cloud first, uh, public cloud first policy, um, but being able to move the cloud is really important to have that dynamic aspect, being able to build out your servers and infrastructure and have it designed in that way. In fact, the Azure DevOps team roll their entire infrastructure for every deployment, including every password and every encryption key. 
Uh, so that's really powerful as well. And that gets you to somewhere where um, it's very difficult for somebody to take over your system and it provides you with a lot more uh, capabilities for scaling. Uh, they are moving towards Docker. Uh, they're moving all of their code over to Linux Docker containers. It's going to take them a long time, uh, but they are doing that as well. And that is Microsoft. Uh, so last, don't overthink. Uh, learn how to fail as quickly as possible. Um, you just need to take one step at a time. Uh, start from where you are and then what's the next most painful thing in your process? Go fix that. Then stop, think about what your next most painful thing is and go take care of that. One thing at a time, uh, keep moving and just uh, a note on the things that changed at Microsoft, pretty much everything changed. The way they do business changed, the way they interact with customers changed, everything changed. Uh, and remember that neither DevOps nor Agile um, are magic. Uh, they are complementary practices that will help show you uh, your problems, make your problems transparent. Thank you very much. Uh, there is a link to download uh, this presentation or to view it uh, online. Uh, thank you very much for, for your time. I hope I was able to answer all of your questions. Thank you very much. <laughs>